Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and it's uh, middle of February, and Corey Sly has agreed to come back on the show. He was back how long ago was it just a few months wasn't it Corey? in october Corey was on the show in october and he's the outdoorsman dad on social media and that's where we met and Corey's agreed to do a food show i don't think Corey, i've ever done a food show a field to plate type show and that's why i wanted to get you on because i know that's one of your passions so Corey sly from western pennsylvania welcome back to whitetail rendezvous sir Great to be back. Thanks for having me on, Bruce. Well, you're welcome. You're always welcome to Whitetail Roundup. That's for dang sure. So let's just start off. We've taken a, a doe or a buck. It doesn't matter. Uh, we've taken a deer. Now we're going to process it in the field. And then I just want to go through all the steps that you take to get it from field to plate. I think the most important thing is field care. If you don't do it right in the field and you contaminate meat with entrails or something like that, you can really put an off-putting taste on the meat. So I think that's an important step in the process. And to get them the body temperature down as quickly as possible is also important. So in the early season, I get the entrails out as quickly as possible, get it home and get it skinned out as quickly as possible. Especially in Pennsylvania, the early season, early archery season, beginning of October can get pretty warm. And so I love to let it hang in my garage, but that's not always the case. I can't always do that. So I actually just got a garage fridge so I can hang it. Or I also use coolers, put frozen water bottles in, in a cooler, put a nice clean rag on top of those frozen water bottles and put the meat right on top of that and keep rotating it until I'm able to process the deer and, and to bone it out and everything. Let's stop right there because okay. uh, folks... A lot of people just go to, they get out of the mountains and they go buy ice and they throw it in their cooler and then put the meat on the ice and that's it. Or even if they get a long trek, they use dry ice, you know, dry ice. But I was listening to somebody talk the other day and what he did was exactly what you did. And they said it's the best way to keep meat. And so take the gallon milk jugs, plastic milk jugs, wash them out, fill them with water, put them in your freezer, and then take those and put them on the bottom of your cooler. Then you put a, some sort of cloth and then you just layer the meat on there. And as you said, then you rotate the meat as it is. So one, there's great coolers out there. I'm not going to give shout outs for any one company. There's great coolers. So you can keep your meat a lot cooler a lot longer and it can age it. Now let's talk about aging temperature. What's your favorite aging temperature? I don't always have the best conditions to age and I've only kind of dipped my toe into aging. I do a wet age more than anything. I vacuum seal it, pat the, the meat dry and vacuum seal it and leave it in my fridge for a couple of weeks to wet age. But I haven't really messed with dry aging. The I never had the perfect equipment to do that setup. So I haven't done that a whole lot. I'd like to get into that now that I got an extra fridge in the garage and can control my temperatures. So I'm not a very good source on aging, but like you said, the, the frozen water bottles is a perfect way to keep things cool. What it does is when that ice melts, you don't have your meat sitting in a pool of water sucking out all that flavor. It's that water stays in that bottle and I rotate bottles and I rotate the meat inside the cooler so it keeps things nice and cold. I'll put a water bottle in between the layers of the meat and it keeps things nice and cool. And like you said, there's a lot of good coolers out there that really help with that process as well. Let's go back to in the field and whitetails is pretty simple to break down, you know, to clean out, to process in the field, to gut, if you want to just say what 
you're actually doing. When you live out west, as I do, and start breaking down elk, it's a little more arduous task. You just have to stay organized and work through the process. I think about whitetails, more and more people are actually quartering their whitetail and um, they're not dragging it out anymore. I can remember back in the day, we'd drag them further than I like to even think about now, just because we couldn't get in the fields because they were wet or whatever, and we'd have to drag them out. Now with ATVs, and it's a lot simpler. But some people, especially DIY hunters who get back into the swamps, get on public land, and they're getting back, they're breaking them down into quarters and then carrying out the deer that way. They'll take the head with them or whatever parts they have to take legally, and then they'll break them down. Talk us through how you take a deer apart, how you process a deer in the field. Well, I've never quartered it and packed it out like most hunters do out west. We have the Allegheny National Forest that's nearby, and I, I know of some hunters that get way back in there that pack it out like that. But where I'm hunting, I'm relatively close to a road. Half mile is probably my longest drag. It's a long drag to me that's I'm more comfortable with skinning a whole deer than trying to break it down in the field. And a lot of times it's an evening hunt. And by the time I get to the deer, it's dark out. So for me, it's just easier to drag it out whole and then skin and break it down at home. But when I go hunting, I always have quart and gallon Ziploc bags because I keep the heart and I keep the liver. I keep the call fat. Call fat is that lacy fat that, that's around the, the intestines and stomach and when you cook with it, it imparts moisture into the meat since venison's a little, you know, a little leaner than beef. So it imparts moisture. So I keep the call fat. I remove the entrails as quickly as possible. And, and if there's snow or maybe a stream or something in there, I'll wash out the cavity and then I'll get that home as quickly as possible, especially in the earlier season when it's warmer to get it out home and to skin it, quarter it and get it in the coolers. Uh, later, if it's rifle season or the late season, I'll bring it home, skin it, and let it hang in the in the garage or in my shed for a few days. But like I said, I don't do a whole lot with aging at this point. So my goal is just to get it home, get it broken down, and get it cut up so I can start eating it. So, so you cut the deer out even at night? Do you take them apart at night? Uh, yeah, if I try to be as prepared as possible. I always have at least three knives on me at any given time, and I always have two or three flashlights with me, a headlamp and then a handheld flashlight. So if I need to get it in the dark, I'm able to. It's, it's definitely not as fun doing that, but, I mean, it's easy enough to do when you have the right equipment. Whitetail Rendezvous and Strike Force Energy have joined together. What have they joined together to do? Well, they joined together to help you kick the can. That's right. Strike Force Energy is the fastest growing new energy drink on Amazon today. It's simple. All you do is rip, drip, and sip. That's it. No sugar, no crash, no calories. It gives you the ability to focus and stay in the stand, stay on the hunt all day long without carrying around the can. When I get a sample pack, simply go to strikeforceenergy.com put in wr free and you'll get a four count sample pack from strike force energy was in iowa one time with judd cooney and hunting at his farms and what they do one if you hit a deer and they don't see him go down in the evening they just leave the deer because if he didn't go down within 150 yards then he's not going to drop right away there's always elements to that but he leaves them overnight and then he goes in the next day and they take sleds and big feeder sled where you put feed in for cattle and they take those in and then they put the whole deer in it and then they take it out because they don't take the guts out in the field. They just don't want the coyotes and all that to be feeding or tracting. And so that's their process. And so when they get back to the barn, they just hoist them up, open them up, everything drops into the same sled and then they take it and dispose of it. And which I thought was a kind of a cool idea. And then we use that. We have sleds now at the farm because we have tons of coyotes and we put the entrails and everything into the pit. You know, the farmer has a pit. So we put them in there and then we sit up and, and, and shoot the coyotes, <laughs> which, you know, is all well and good. I hope that's legal in Wisconsin. I just thought of that. Well, folks, so be it. 
get a hold of me and let me know that I can't do that. But uh, when I'm hunting with my dad, since there will be two of us, and we'll drag. My dad prefers to drag it out wholesale without gutting it in the field. And at our rifle stands, we have a cart with wheels that we'll take it out on. It makes it a little bit easier to get out. But I don't like to do that when I'm by myself. It's a lot harder dragging an ungutted deer by yourself. Yeah, it sure is. And it's been done. So do you take the back straps off? Well, do you take the tenderloins out in the field or when you get back? When I get back for the most, yeah, unless I make a mistake or it's a bad shot and things, I can't get things as clean as I'd want, I'll take them out. But for the most part, I leave them in there until I get it hung up. And once it's hanging, those are the first things that come out, go in the fridge and have them for dinner. Right. Well, the fresher you get them, the better. And, right. and just depends on the temperature because you can leave them in, in the deer and you can age them a little bit. You know, that's what we do. We try not to let them freeze because they're too hard to work getting the hide off and everything. Right. Because Typical Wisconsin meat pole or any meat pole you've ever seen in pictures. That was the way you hung up the deer and they stayed up there till you went home. And then they were still, they still had the hide out. <laughs> that was back in the day. And then they ate venison then and we eat venison now, but we're getting a little bit better. Having said that, okay, so we get the deer home. It's early season. So we've broken it down. Now, what do you do for packaging? After I get it cut up and deboned? Yeah. I have a vacuum sealer that I use for the back straps. I use butcher paper if I'm going to do a roast. And then I just use quart bags, quart freezer bags for any ground meat because it's easy to put about a pound in there and then you smush it flat and you push all the air out and it's easy to store. So that's, I prefer to to use the quart bags for the, the ground meat. When I'm cutting up a deer, I like to think what kind of meals I want to make front shoulders for like a bone-in blade roast, so I'll keep that whole one. I won't take any meat off for grind. For the hindquarters, I like to separate the hindquarters by the muscle groups. And once you get in there, you can easily pull apart by the muscle groups with just a little few cuts here, and they'll come apart themselves basically and freeze those whole. I have a Kamado Joe. It's a, a ceramic charcoal grill. So it's basically like a a wood fired oven and I like to throw whole chunks of the hind quarter on the Kamado Joe at like 450 500 degrees and get them to medium rare and pull them off slice them thin it's some of the best eating venison that there is so and it, it doesn't take a whole lot to make venison taste good I uh one of my go-to ways to cook a back strap or a piece out of the hind quarter is olive oil and then cover it in seasonings and I, I like to use tactical seasonings. They have all different blends and, and flavors. A salt and pepper is one of my favorite blends. And it just gives it enough, enough heat that gives it that flavor, but not overpowering. And you can really make a good meal out of that. You mentioned you take some of the hamburger, but you don't make it in the hamburger. You keep it just in a pound piece of meat that you're going to grind later. Is that correct? What I typically do is I grind it all at once and I put, oh, a pound, okay. yeah, I put a pound, separate it into pound quart bags, you know, with the family of five, there's my wife and my three kids, three young kids. So a pound feeds us pretty well, but soon we're going to have to probably up that two pounds, but yeah, it's quick. If you push it flat to get all the air out, it only takes, it doesn't take very long to thaw it out. And my wife loves cooking with the venison. We make a lot of easy meals. We really enjoy the ground venison, so we'll keep a roast here and there, you know, the bone-in blade roast and, and stuff like that. But the ground venison is what the kids like to eat, and we make – there's all manner of, you know, tacos and, and sloppy joes and chili and everything, all that type of stuff that my kids will eat too. So I use a lot of the ground venison. So you've taken the deer apart, and then how do you set up your meat processing then? Because you have a grinder. And you get bins, and and if you're going to make jerky, or if you're going to make sausage, or heat them up, as we call kibasas, and for the morning, how does all that work? Well, it depends on how many deer I have so far that year. Like the first deer, and we keep it simple: the steaks and the ground venison. We don't do many roasts with that first one because we prefer ground. But as we get, as I'm more successful, start getting a little more creative. I'll keep 
whole roasts. But typically, after I get it skinned out and it's in the coolers and family of five, my time is limited during the day. So when I typically work at processing the deer is, is at night when the kids go to bed and I'll do hind quarter or front shoulder per night and I'll debone it. And like I said earlier, the hind quarters I keep in the muscle groups, front shoulders I typically grind. I'll keep some shanks for like an also buco and rib meat. I try to, to save all the rib meat and everything. And even my trim meat that a lot of people throw away, I keep that as well. I keep the trim meat and the bones to make my own stock. And then I will keep the back straps as whole pieces. I, I cut them once lengthwise and have whole pieces of the length of my arm. And I'll freeze those like that. And I work on that throughout the week and get all that. And once I get all my trim pieces and pieces for the grinder, I'll grind it in one night. And I don't typically mix anything in into it if I'm grinding just straight venison burger. But I'll get that all ground. And the kids love helping me grind the burger. And we'll put those in bags and get everything frozen. And But as I am more successful... I'll make sauce. I, I love venison sausage and I usually do 50 50 grind with pork butt. So I'll just, I'll buy a pork butt from the local butcher and I have a kitchen scale. So I try to do even weights 50 50. And Tactic Calories also has a venison sausage kit. They have maple seasoning and a spicy seasoning and both of those are really good. And then jerky to me is kind of a novelty, it's a treat. So it doesn't go, and you know, it loses at least 50% of its weight. So it's not very um, cost effective. So it won't be, if I'm fortunate enough to get a third or a fourth deer for the year, that's when I start making the jerky and bologna and snack sticks and that type of stuff. But I've done jerky both the with ground venison and with the whole muscle slicing it thin. And I think the slicing it thin from the whole muscle definitely tastes better. You have that same texture and taste that you would from like the jerky that you'd buy in the grocery store. I don't think the ground jerky gets quite as, it doesn't get that snap when you bite into it, if you know what I mean. I I have made my own sausages with natural casings. My grinder has that attachment. It's an arduous process and probably only because I've done it a couple of times, so I'm not very good at it. So We set aside a whole day to make the sausage and to stuff the casings. The back straps, I do it no matter which deer it is, I do it the same way. I just, I leave it whole. And if I'm either cook it whole, which what I do most of the time, and sometimes I made like Philly cheesesteaks and I have a meat slicer. So we'll slice that real thin and hit it in the cast iron really, really hot for just a couple minutes and put that with some melted cheese and, and onions and peppers and that can't beat that so oh that's that tastes good i haven't had my supper yet and i'm starting to salivate that's for sure hey whitetail hunters we're on the lookout for some great whitetail rendezvous success stories if you listen to one or a hundred whitetail rendezvous podcasts and learned an insight from an episode that upped your confidence or success while hunting whitetails and you feel your story is something that other hunters could learn from, we'd love for you to share your story. If you're interested in sharing your story, let me know by sending me an email to whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com or reach out to me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Just message me there and I'll get in touch. Again, please send me an email to whitetailrendezvous.com and I'll contact you. We'll be sharing your story with all of the Whitetail Rendezvous community. And just wait for the first 40 hunters that share their story. There'll be a surprise bonus for each of you. It's our way of saying thanks for helping the other hunters in the Whitetail Rendezvous community to be more successful this fall. Stay tuned for some exciting things coming from Whitetail Rendezvous this year. say back in the day when we used to go out west and of course hunt the nine day season gun hunt we'd get the crew would get the bunkhouse crew would get a number of animals and what we did especially early on we'd have a garage set up and it was basically like a butcher shop 
everybody had chipped in. We had all the casings and the bins and everything, and everybody's responsible for their job. And you just go through the process and you just keep pushing the meat because if four guys have an antelope and a mule deer, you know, you've got a couple hundred pounds of meat to process <laughs> easily. And so I, when you were talking, I just think about those days and we were fortunate to have a couple of machines that we could do all the things that we wanted to do. And we had the recipes. Now, how do you keep your recipes for making the summer sausage or making some of the other things? Is that passed down or where'd you get them from? Not a whole lot's passed down. My dad wasn't the greatest wild game cook, isn't the greatest wild game cook. He has a baloney recipe that I like that he's given to me, but other types of recipes, it's, he doesn't have a big recipe catalog. And my grandmother was a great wild game cook, but she never wrote anything down. And by the time I was old enough to appreciate it, she was too old to get in the kitchen. So a lot of the recipes I have are from different wild game cookbooks and online. And then once I got comfortable, I started experimenting for myself. And I had an idea of what I wanted to do and never quite sure how I want to do it, but I had an idea. So I would do some research online and and I'd look at different recipes and I was like, oh, I like that aspect of that recipe, but I don't like that part. But I like that this part of this recipe and oh, I like that one too. And I I would kind of combine and different recipes with the different aspects that I like the most to kind of create my own dish and was kind of passed down to me as well. When I was growing up, we did a lot more small game hunting, rabbits and squirrels, and I would always give those to my aunt, and she would make this amazing small game noodle soup. It was chicken noodle soup, but it was small game. So I've tried to to replicate that with some success, and so I've gotten a lot more creative and a lot more kind of trying to get it out of the box than what I was when I was still living at home, so... So how much wild game does a family eat? That's a good question. We do not buy any meat other than maybe like chicken. We don't buy any meat from the store. And then I have a friend that raises beef and we'll get like 20 or 30 pounds of ground beef from him. But apart from that, all of our red meat is venison. And I think last year we went through about four deer somewhere around there. I had four deer in the freezer and I've already started into the deer that I've halfway through the deer that I've already gotten this past season. So I'd say we go between three and four deer a year. And and then, you know, I supplement that with a lot of fishing. So I have perch and walleye in the, in the freezer and I do some small game hunting. I'd like to do more. So squirrels and rabbits here and there. And I'm trying to get into turkey hunting, but I'm not a successful turkey hunter. But I have, friends have been gracious enough to, to give me turkeys. So we'll add that to, to the mix. And I have a, a good friend that gives me goose breasts. So I think I only have a couple of those left. So I try to diversify my wild game freezer as much as possible. But the majority of it is venison. And, and we go through quite a bit of it a year. And what do you think about all these people that are organic? They're into the word organic. You've been eating organic for a long time. I can see why some people push back on it. It's a different culture or lifestyle or why do you need it now when we didn't? But I welcome it now that we have kids and you see all the processed food at the grocery store. I'm much more conscientious of what my kids are eating. That doesn't mean they don't eat the junk food and stuff that that's not good for them because I can only give it to them. I can't force them to eat it. So they don't always eat what I cook much to my chagrin, but I like the organic aspect. I think people are too disconnected with their food and with this organic philosophy, I think people realize their food is important where their food comes from is important. And if we have more people buying into the organic and sourcing their own food, then we get more support for the hunting community, the hunting lifestyle, the hunting culture. And I think everybody knows hunter numbers are declining. So when that happens and the general public starts to view hunting in a negative light, then our rights start to get picked away because the majority rule is saying hunting's not needed, hunting's barbaric, when you and I both know that's not true. 
So the organic aspect, the food aspect, the local vores, I definitely welcome because if it's bringing new people into hunting and bolstering our ranks of hunters, so we have a strong voice when it comes to public land legislation and hunting legislation, we have the numbers to make our voice heard. Yeah, and that's a good case because S-47 just passed in Congress. And and folks, that's for public lands. And you might think, well, what's important about that? Well, we own public lands and there's a whole group that is involved in that. And millions and millions of people got involved and helped the passage of that bill. But public lands are important because hunting is a tradition and it goes back for me for 53 years. And you're not that old yet, (laughs) Corey. (laughs) But when you think about hunting, How about your kids? What are you teaching them about hunting? They've seen me process deer and fish, so they are not the least bit squeamish when it comes to a dead animal. I try to involve them in the process, and even though those never-ending line of questions can get tiresome at times, I got to remember they're curious, and we want to encourage that curiosity. We want to foster that love for wild game and hunting. So I answer those questions as best I can. And I show them what the different things are. And I take them hunting with me. My daughter has gone small game hunting with me and she's been there and watched as I've shot squirrels. And I think she understands that's where food comes from. So she didn't get upset, which even if she did, I think that's a natural reaction to that. So I tried to explain things that We're using this, we're shooting, we're killing these animals to use them. So we want to respect them by using and utilizing them as much as possible. So that's what I'm trying to teach them to know where their food comes from. They love helping me put the deer in the grinder and making burger and help make sausage and kids love to bake. So we try to involve them in the the kitchen as much as possible. Now, do you have any books out on cooking? I do not know. I know with The Outdoor Dad, you've read blogs and articles and such. If somebody wants to get a hold of you or read some of your stuff, where would they go to to do that? I have a blog on WordPress. It's outdoorsmandad.wordpress.com. I'm on Instagram at outdoorsmandad, and then I have a Facebook page as well at outdoorsmandad. I try to post regularly on the blog. Um, It's a mix between my thoughts and opinions and news in the outdoor realm. And I put recipes up there as well. There's a few recipes that I have in Outdoor News. Outdoor News is a regional publication that's in Minnesota, I believe Michigan, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania. So I've had a few recipes published in there, but uh, the best way is my blog. Okay. Thanks for that. What recommendations would you give to somebody that said, gee, you know, I like to hunt deer, but every year I go and pay a processor a hundred bucks or more to get my meat back. And I've got a couple of different thoughts on that, but what are your thoughts of taking meat to a processor? I haven't in a long time. My view on it is I have the equipment. I have the knowledge. Uh, My dad has taught me most of what I need to know for processing the deer. So I, and most importantly, it's to me, it's a part of the whole hunting experience. It's, I enjoy processing my own deer almost as much as I enjoy hunting the deer. To me, nine o'clock at night, standing at the kitchen counter, deboning out a, a hind quarter is relaxing. I can see that whole deer, that deer turn from an animal into a gourmet meal on my dinner plate. And it's, you know, it gives me a sense of accomplishment. And to people that are taking their deer to a process, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people don't have the time, but there's a lot of resources out there that are available where people can learn how to do it themselves. And processing a whitetail really isn't that difficult. And then you learn so much about the animal, you know, the anatomy and how your shot placement affected the animal and what you should do next time. And, you know, it just takes a few, few pieces of equipment, a couple sharp knives, someplace, somewhere to hang a a nail on the rafter in your garage to hang it up and maybe a hacksaw. And you can do the majority of the work yourself. 
And so I would tell people, don't be afraid to do it. There's a lot of resources out there. It doesn't take a whole lot of money to get the equipment that you need to, in order to do it. And it's a learning experience. And to me, it's enjoyable. So I would encourage people to try it out for themselves. And the one thing that I've learned over the years, just because of work and everything, I'd hunt and then I'd take the deer to the processor. Because when I was in Wisconsin, I lived in Colorado. So I wanted to get it processed before I threw it in coolers and took it home or even flew it home. But the question I always wanted to ask and did ask is, will I get my own deer back? And sometimes the answer is no. So I'm going, wait a minute. I don't know how that person took care of it in the field. I don't know how long it was hung. I don't know anything about that meat. And yet I'm paying them good money. And somebody, I know what I did with my deer. I know this is grade A, it's as good as it can get. And somebody else is going to get my deer and I'm going to get somebody else's deer. And that's listeners. I would ask that question. Am I going to get my own deer back? And if they say no, then go find yourself a different processor or learn to do it yourself. Right. It's not that hard. I mean, we we took the bunkhouse crew and Randall's, Randall's and his friend. And with my limited help, I think we processed six deer last year, you know, and it took a while. You know, we didn't do it all in one sitting. It took a while. But at the end, we had X number of pounds of grind. I called that's what I call hamburger. Then we had steaks and chops and roast. And you get the back strap and we butterfly those. And then, of course, you get 10 loins and they were gone before the end of the week because we ate pretty good. But when you think of that, folks, it doesn't take long, especially if you make an investment in the tools and then. One, cleanliness is, is critically important and hanging your deer and then doing it yourself. And once you do that, you're going to get where Corey is and I am that all of a sudden you're part of the whole process and harvesting's great and that's fun, but the processing a deer and then the eating the deer is better than the hunt. To me, it is. And I think Corey, it's the same to you. You've expressed that already. Right. That takes so much pleasure in getting a deer, getting it home, and then preparing it and gourmet meals on the plate. It doesn't get any better than that. No, it doesn't. So, yeah, like you were saying, you never know when you take it to the processor, you never know what you're going to get back if you're getting the amount back that you should get back. So, just take that completely out of the equation and do it yourself. Hey, thanks for listening to the show tonight. Before we go, can I just say a moment and say thank you? Listen, as we started the Whitetail Rendezvous podcast journey, we had no idea what to expect. But after four years, we received a ton of feedback from our over 400,000 listeners and climbing to half a million. Speaking of which, we are now closing in on over 600 featured guests. Thank you. And a quick shout out to all those who have left an iTunes review and your feedback. I get those and really appreciate it. And it's awesome to see what you have to say. And we do read every single one of them. And I just want you to know that I am incredibly grateful for your kind words regarding the show. And all of the ratings and reviews help us attract more listeners. And if you're one of those new listeners, welcome. Great to have you. By the way, if you haven't taken the time to rate and review our show and like the hunting on private land strategy on how to get permission to hunt a private property, go to whitetailrendezvous.com as a special gift for just rating and reviewing our show. When you get there, look for the start button to get the details. Listen, I'll share you the top technique from some of the top hunters in the country on how do they get permission to hunt on private land. I'll share with you the exact techniques they use to get permission. As my way of saying thanks for rating and reviewing the show on iTunes. So join us next time. And remember, we're all on this journey together, learning, sharing, and becoming 365 Hunters. As we wrap up here, do you have any final thoughts for people that are going to get involved and field to plate? I would just say, don't be afraid to experiment, to try new things, to try different recipes. And if you know the cut of meat and you know what you're going for, there's a lot of different ways to get there. And 
And so I was afraid to ruin the meat and waste something, but that'll happen every once in a while. But don't be afraid to try something different than just steaks and hamburger. Yeah, there's a lot of resources out there nowadays that you can really make some pretty amazing meals out of wild game. Well, Corey, I want to thank you for spending your time half an hour with Whitetail Rendezvous and just sharing your input. And I look forward to the next time we get to sit down and talk about hunting whitetails in Western Pennsylvania. Thanks for having me on, Bruce. It was fun. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.